forces are often interpreted as massive. This is most likely a misconception due to the fact that there were many non-combatants on both sides. The Afghan forces are generally considered to be around 60,000 strong, with a large part of those forces being from the Ud and Rahila states. The Marathas, on the other hand, had around 45,000 troops. The Shah's own troops numbered around 42,000, with 28,000 heavy Afghan cavalry, 10,000 infantry, 40 cannons, and 200 camel-mounted swivel guns. Shuja ud Dula from the Ud state had around 3,000 men with him, with similar numbers of infantry and cavalry. He also brought 20 guns. Najib ud Dola of the Rahila state had about 15,000 men under his command, with roughly a third of them being cavalry. The Shah placed his elite Afghan heavy cavalry in the center and on the extremes of the flanks, and the forces of his allies were placed between them. This move was not just a battle tactic, but was also meant partially to prevent his Indian allies from fleeing the field of battle in case it didn't go well. His center stretched between the villages of Risalu and Uja and was led by Shah Vali Khan. Besides the 15,000 elite Afghan heavy cavalry, Vali Khan also had a significant amount of camel-mounted artillery with him and 1,000 Afghan infantry. The Afghan left was placed on the plains between Risalu and Siwa, and it was led by Najib ud Dola, who commanded 5,000 elite cavalry and 15,000 footmen, including a large number of dismounted cavalry. The Durrani right was led by a multitude of commanders and stretched from Chajpur Kurd to Uja. It consisted of 10,000 footmen and around 7,000 horsemen, out of which 3,000 were elite heavy cavalry. Ahmad Shah stayed behind the battle lines with the rest of his troops so that he could observe the battle and send aid where it was needed. The Maratha numbers added up to 45,000, with the vast majority of the army consisting of cavalry and some 8,000 elite musketeers under Ibrahim Ghadi. Sedashiv Rao made sure to isolate the unpopular Ghadi infantry and place them on the extreme left. The Ghadi infantry had most of the heavy artillery with them, while the light artillery was mixed between the right and center. Sedashiv Rao led the center. The cavalry on the left was commanded by Damaji Gaikwa, while the right was led by Malha Rauhoka. The battle began on the morning of the 14th of January, 1761, with artillery volleys from both sides. Following the cannonade, Gadi ordered his heavy artillery to fire directly on the Afghan right. However, the cannons were not precise and minimal damage was done. Seeing that, he ordered his musketeers to advance and fire on the enemies. The Rohillas on the Afghan right suffered significant casualties. However, their counterfire killed many Gadis and forced them to retreat behind their artillery. Gaikwa attacked the cavalry on the Afghan right as well. However, he was driven back, with only Gadi musket volleys saving his units from a complete rout. Simultaneously, the centers of the two armies started fighting as well, with artillery barrages being exchanged. The Maratha artillery was effective, however, the lighter camel-mounted swivels of the Afghans dealt many more casualties and even disabled some of the Maratha guns. All of a sudden, the Maratha cannons stopped firing and a loud war cry was heard, signaling a massive charge of the elite Maratha cavalry. The momentum of their charge was overpowering, and they almost broke through the Afghan lines. The Maratha offensive in the center caused confusion within the Afghan forces, with only the commander's guard holding their ground. Nevertheless, the light Maratha cavalry was not able to maintain their momentum for long, and the fighting drew to a stalemate. Ahmad Shah observed the battle from two kilometers away, and kept regular lines of communication between the battlefield commanders and himself. 
having learned of the casualties sustained on the right and of the center almost crumbling. He sent around 3,000 men from his reserve to aid the Rahillas and another 4,000 to reinforce Vali Khan. This proved to be the crucial point of the battle, as Sadashiv Rao neither had any reserves nor did he keep any contact with his commanders. Najibud Dola, a clever commander himself, ordered most of his cavalry to dismount and his artillery corps to fire lasting barrages at the enemy lines. These barrages were not meant to do any damage, but to provide cover for his footmen as they advanced. Every 400 meters, his infantry erected small walls of sand and soil to hide behind as their artillery prepared for a new barrage. By 1 p.m., Najibut Dola's forces were one kilometer away from their counterparts. This was an ingenious move for several reasons. Their proximity to the Maratha right caused fear among their troops, and it inhibited them from aiding the other flanks. Around 1 p.m., as soon as the reinforcements reached the battle lines, the momentum of the battle started to shift. Ahmad Shah ordered all of his commanders to start a massive offensive against the Maratha forces. Shah Vali Khan started putting pressure on the Maratha center with his fresh troops. However, the Maratha forces held their ground. Ahmed Shah finally sent 2,000 of his elite heavy cavalry to attack the Maratha center from all sides. This, along with the constant fire from the camel-mounted artillery, caused many casualties. In spite of this, Sadashiv Rao led three countercharges, which, though unsuccessful, killed many Afghan soldiers. Meanwhile, the Afghan right almost completely destroyed the Gadi infantry on the Maratha left and captured Gadi himself too. The Maratha cavalry on that side also began retreating in panic. On the other flank, musket fire from the Afghan forces drew a wedge between two parts of the Maratha line, which made their advance easier. Surrounded and under constant fire from all sides, all semblance of order broke down in the Maratha center. Sadashiv Rao, though wounded three times, fought bravely before he too was killed. This was the final nail in the coffin for the Marathas, as the rest of their forces were subsequently slaughtered or routed. The Afghan forces chased the fleeing Marathas and slaughtered many during the retreat. Accounts regarding the number of casualties vary depending on the sources, though modern estimates agree that the Maratha losses were around 30,000. Over 20,000 of the non-combatants were enslaved, and the Afghans also took 700 elephants and thousands of horses and camels. The Afghans lost between 10,000 and 20,000 men, most of whom were from the Rahila or Oud state. As both sides were exhausted by war, the peace treaty was fairly mild. The Marathas lost control over parts of northern India and had to recognize Alam II as Mughal Emperor. But besides that, not much changed. Though Durrani won, his position was not enviable either, as he was unable to follow up on this victory and quickly retreated to Afghanistan. In the following decades, the Afghans and Rohillas struggled with the Sikhs in Punjab and failed to capitalize on their new position. In contrast, the Marathas under Madhav Rao began a revival and expanded their influence once again over the north. In the end, this did not last either. Decentralization and infighting among Maratha nobles severely weakened the empire in the decades after Madhav Rao's untimely death and the Maratha Empire, as well as Indian independence, met their ends at the hands of the British in 1818, ushering in a new age for India. We have more videos on the history of India on their way, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the